I'm a, I'm a grumpy sleeper. Meaning that if you wake me up in the middle of my REM cycle, I'm not the most pleasant person to be around. In fact, if you measured my holiness and my sanctification based on how I respond when I'm woken up in the middle of the night, you'd be like, that guy needs Jesus. Like, it's, it's bad. And, and I'm working on this. I'm working on my attitude when my kids wake me up or I, I get woken up from a sound. I, I just love sleeping, and I don't like being woken up in my half conscious state. I'm not my best self in those moments. And Hannah, she really never met sleepy, grumpy Justin until well into our marriage when we had kids. You know, because before you had kids, you could just sleep through anything. But all of a sudden, we had kids, and I was waking up two to seven times a night. And I I can remember thinking before having kids, like, well, I've I've done sleepless nights. I've done the late night college study stuff. I've toured and I've stayed up for three. I've gotten only three hours of sleep and functioned as a touring musician. Surely I can handle this. And I was wrong. (laughs) I I wasn't prepared for the lack of sleep that came with kids. And it didn't help that we started off our journey with one of the worst sleepers possible. Shout out to Henry, who's also watching online right now. And, uh, you know, it was one of those things that was rough for the first few months, and people said, oh, no, it'll, it'll get better from here. Don't worry. And then a year went by, and they were like, don't worry, it'll get better. And it didn't really get better. A year and a half, two years. And we just fell into this routine of not getting any sleep. And I, I can remember after about a year of this, I was so tired, and I was so worn out, and I was so frustrated. Like, it just it had built up within me. And I, I just had this moment of weakness. I was like, God, where are you? Like, I keep praying that you'll help Henry sleep. And instead, I look at the monitor, and this kid's chewing on the crib, eating splinters for breakfast. (laughs) I I keep praying, God, that you will meet me in this moment. I was like, I can't do it anymore. Like, I'm tired. I'm worn out. I'm grumpy. I'm tired of pretending like everything's okay. And I know it's kind of a silly example, good news for you parents who might be soon expecting or have young kids, it does get better. But I know that that more than just me, you you felt this way before, and not necessarily just with your kids, maybe you felt this way with your kids, but I know you've been in those seasons of life, like where, where one minute life is just cruising by, things are going well, and then suddenly life takes a turn And you find yourself in a situation that leads you to ask, where are you, God? Where are you in my illness? Where are you in my grief, in my disappointment? Like, I don't know if I can do this marriage anymore. I don't know if I can do this this job anymore. I I can't be in this living situation. See, what I, I recognize today is that there are a number of you here today who walk through the doors, and life is going so well for you. And God is answering your prayers, and he's moving in mighty ways in you and through you. And if that's you today, we celebrate that with you. That is amazing. We are so happy for what God is doing in your life. But I also recognize that for every person who came in and life is going great, there's another person who it took all you had to get through the doors of of this church. You're exhausted. You're worn out. And if you're anything like me, sometimes we're, we're in those valleys of life, and you look up at the mountaintop, and you see God answering prayers in other people's lives, and you see him doing mighty things. And, and the temptation is to say, well, well, God, I see you doing that in their life. Why aren't you doing that in my life? Why, why aren't you meeting me in my brokenness, in my weakness? And, and sometimes we confuse the, the fact that God is doing something in somebody else's life and not in ours as God's absence. And we wonder, is is God actually with us? If that's you today, I want you to know that you're not alone. That God is Emmanuel, which means God is with us, not just in the mountaintops, but in the valleys as well. And as we kick off this Advent season, I want to really dial in to what it means to wait in the season of Advent. What does it mean to wait on hope in the coming of the Messiah. And, and today our, our scripture feels very appropriate because it's, it's not, uh, it's, a, it's a psalm and coming out of the Thanksgiving season, it, it seems very appropriate because it's known as a psalm of Thanksgiving. 
And so we're going to look at Psalm 23. Uh, I'll, I'll spare you, Cade, who's up there doing slides. I did not have time to put slides in there. So um, it was the last minute this morning. So you guys will just have to hear the Bible like it was originally read, you know, because back in the day, first century, people couldn't read. They just had to listen. So um, my apologies. Ne- next time I'll, I'll get them up there. But Psalm 23 is written by King David. And, and while we don't know precisely when in his life he wrote this, we do know that David was no stranger to difficult times. David had been uh, had plenty of experience being hunted down by his king. He'd experienced betrayal from his king, from his friends, from his own children. He experienced the loss of a child. Like David was all too familiar with walking through the valleys of life. In fact, in Psalm 22, he says as much. He says this, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. And this is a man we know as, as a man after God's own heart. And I don't know who needs to hear this today, but even David, a man after God's own heart, struggled with doubt at times. Even David struggled with doubt at times. And I think sometimes in in church with a capital C here in America, maybe we've done a bit of a disservice to those who are experiencing doubt, experiencing questions. We, We maybe have shoved them under the rug at times because we don't want to engage in the hard questions. But if that's you today and you're struggling with doubt or you've got big questions about faith, you're in the right place. Because here at City Hope, you don't have to believe to belong. If you came with questions, if you're trying to figure out this whole faith thing, you're in the right place because we believe we serve a big God who can meet you in your big questions. Here's David, Psalm 22. He's been through tragedy and loss and grief, and yet this is what he writes in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And I I just want to pause there because there's a few Hebrew words in here that I don't want us to miss. I think they really set the stage for helping us understand this text. The first word is the word shepherd. And I don't know what you think think of, excuse me, when you hear the word shepherd. I don't know if you picture a, a little boy playing a harp on a grassy knoll while the sheep are frolicking in the meadow. But, but truthfully, the life of a shepherd thousands of years ago in the Middle East was anything but, but peaceful. There, there was very little frolicking in this context. The life of a shepherd was brutal. It it was difficult. It was challenging. And King David knew this because he was a shepherd himself. Let me, let me paint a picture of, of, of what a year looked like in a shepherd's life. So in, in the Middle East, they get very little rain in the rainy season, maybe four to six inches in this part of Judea on a a yearly basis. It's, It's very little. And so you have to be strategic as a shepherd to make sure you can feed your sheep. So what you do is you, you wait until summertime and the mountaintops begin to get exposed to more heat and sun. And with that exposure so close to the sun, the, the foliage starts to grow. And so in summertime, you take your sheep and you lead them up the mountainside into those green pastures. And you have the sheep eat there and feed. And then as winter comes in and, and fall kind of comes in, it gets colder. And so you move down the mountain and into the valleys where now the foliage has grown. And it's kind of this cyclical season that a shepherd operates in. And here's here's what the common theme is in in this passage. And and here's the the mark of a good shepherd, regardless of if you're on the mountaintop or in the valley or you're being chased by predators, whatever it is, a good shepherd never abandons his flock. And David is saying, God is like the good shepherd. 
He never abandons his flock. And we are the sheep. Think about that for a minute. That's, on the one hand, that's a beautiful metaphor, right? God is a shepherd leading us through the hills and the valleys of life, never abandons us. But then the other half of that is a little bit insulting, isn't it? Like we're sheep. And this was just as insulting thousands of years ago as it is today. Because here's a universal truth across all space and time. Sheep are dumb. They're dumb. They're, they're so short-sighted. They, they don't make wise decisions. They're habitual. They're, they're driven by food. I can't tell you how many times my, my mother-in-law and my father-in-law, they have sheep. How, many, how they could be in a safe pasture grazing with a fence around them and still manage to get themselves in trouble or break a leg. Sheep are dumb. They're, they're short-sighted. So, so God is a shepherd. We are the sheep. And then the other word I don't want us to miss is, is in verse 1. It's the word want. And some translations translate it as I lack nothing. Either way, the, the Hebrew word for that is chaser. Go ahead and look at your neighbor with that guttural, throaty H. Say chaser. It kind of hurts to say it. This, this word is used throughout Scripture. Uh, Deuteronomy, for example, Deuteronomy 2.7, it's used. It says, these 40 years, the Lord your God has been with you. You have haser, you have lacked nothing. In other words, in this, this first opening sentence, we're to understand that we are like sheep being led through the hills and valleys of life by God the shepherd who never abandons us. And if we follow him, we will lack nothing. And notice this passage, it doesn't seem to suggest that valleys are optional. Valleys are a lot like the seasons. They come and go there to be expected. In fact, Jesus himself said, in this world, you will have trouble. No, the reality is we will all walk through valleys of darkness, through grief, through pain, through heartache, through betrayal, through disappointment. But God, just like a good shepherd, never abandons his flock. About a year ago, maybe you remember this story. We, uh, my parents took our family on a little two or three day getaway to an indoor water park. And um, it was a really nice water park. I mean, they had the lazy river, the wave pool, the slides. And it was a great break in the middle of winter. And we decided with the kids that the best way to operate was kind of to divide and conquer. So Henry went off with my dad to the little red slide that he kept going down. Junie went to the wave pool with my mom. Uh, Ezra needed a nap, so he went with his sleep-deprived mom. I don't really remember what I was doing during that time. Either way, I, I'm sure I was helping out in some capacity. <laughs> but I went to go connect with my dad and Henry, and I, I walked over, and I found my dad, but I didn't find Henry. And my dad, I mean, to his credit, he looked away just for maybe 10 seconds. And in that time, Henry had bolted. We started looking for him. He was lost. I mean, at first, I'm trying to keep my calm and my composure. I'm walking around looking for him. Can't find him. Eventually, it gets to the point that I go and get security. We've got the security team and the lifeguards helping us look for him. And I'm getting more nervous. My mom is crying. My wife is taking a nap, which is good, because if she wasn't, she would be crying. We're freaked out. Where is Henry? And after about 20 minutes, I look up at this big slide, and I see this little yellow life jacket and Henry's blonde hair. And we found him. It was so overwhelming. And it just happened to be that he was going down the same slide over and over. Every time we would go up to look for him, he just happened to be going down the slide. And then we would go down the slide. He'd go up, and I said, Henry, where were you? We lost you. And he said, Dad, I wasn't lost. I was just riding down the slide. Can I tell you that there is nothing that I wouldn't have done to find Henry that day? I, I would have locked the doors of that park and not let anybody out. I would have called the Coast Guard. I would have done anything to find my son because I love him. 
And God is a good shepherd that never abandons his flock. And there are some of you here today who need to hear this because you have family and friends and neighbors who have long since left the church. Maybe they've long since left the faith and you need to hear this. They may have given up on God, but God never gives up on them. Look at what Jesus says in Luke. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and his neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. Jesus stands at the doors of our hearts knocking. God is a good shepherd who never abandons his flock. I love the rest of this passage, verses 5 and 6. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. One more word I don't want us to miss, and that is that word, follow me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. And that word, that, that's the NRSV translation, but it doesn't really do justice to that Hebrew word in its fullness. Because in other instances throughout Scripture, that, that Hebrew word follow, it's the word redap. And, and in, other, in other texts, it's used as like a, an enemy pursuing people, chasing after them, hunting them down, if you will. And so the, the word that feels more appropriate, we could, we could read it more like this. Surely goodness and mercy shall pursue me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. The goodness and mercy of God pursue you through the hills and through the valleys. As the song says, your goodness is running after me. God never abandons his flock. But I think here's something that we can take from this text as well. God never abandons his flock, but he also never wastes a valley. God never abandons his flock, but he also never wastes a valley. Here's what I mean. My son did run away, but I didn't cause him to run away. I I lost him for a short time. I didn't influence him in any way to say it's okay to run off and, and do your own thing without telling your parents. And even though I was happy I found my, my son, I also made sure that I didn't waste that moment. I sat down with him. I told him how much I loved him. But I told him, it's not okay for you to run off like that, buddy. Like, you got to stay close. And I never want my kids to get lost again. But if Junie or Ezra or Henry, if they get lost again, I'll, I'll use that as a teaching moment to help them grow in responsibility. God never abandons his flock, but he also never wastes a valley. God likely isn't the cause of your marital struggle. He's not the cause of your financial loss or the health crisis or the grief or the betrayal or the anxiety, but God also won't waste it. God can use those moments, those valleys of life when you're desperate for help, for healing and for rest. Those can be the very places when God grows you in your faith, in your trust, and your dependency on him. So, so many of us, we want those mountaintop experiences. We, we want to have those moments of intimacy with God where we have a vibrant prayer life and unshakable faith. And as Philip Keller says, we speak of these mountaintop experiences and we envy those who have ascended the heights and entered into a more sublime sort of life. He goes on to say, often we get an erroneous idea about how this takes place. It is as though we imagine we could be airlifted onto higher ground. But on the rough trail of the Christian life, this is not so. As with ordinary sheep management, so with God's people, one only gains higher ground by climbing up through the valleys. Every mountain has its valleys. Its sides are scarred by deep ravines and gulches and draws, and the best route to the top is always along those valleys. You will experience valleys of life, hardship, pain, grief. They will happen, but God will never abandon you in those valleys. He will lead you through the valley to higher ground if you follow him. If you stay with him, you will lack nothing. 
He'll develop your integrity in the darkness. He'll develop your character so that one day you can serve as a beacon of hope to those who are in a similar place that you were once in. He'll use your story to reach that person sitting next to you or behind you who so desperately needs to know that there is hope and a future for them. You know, so often we pray prayers like, God, save me from the valley. Save me from the sickness. Save me from, from the grief or this relational struggle. And I don't think those are bad things to pray, but, but maybe we should just start off and, and change those words a bit. Instead of saying, God, save me from the valley, start off by praying, God, save me through the valley. God, save me through this crisis. Make me more like you. Help me to draw closer to you. Help me to follow you so closely that I lack nothing. Romans 5, 3 says, not only so, but also we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. God never abandons his flock, but he also never wastes a valley. And if you will draw close to God in those difficult times, you will lack nothing. He will lead you. He will guide you. He will sustain you through the darkest valley. And as we reflect on that and as we're reminded of, of that good news, I can't help but think of all those people in our community right now who don't have that hope. The, the people who don't have the hope and the the, the, the knowledge of the salvation of Jesus, that Christ can guide them through the darkest times. I, I think of those, those little kids that are within a one-mile radius of here who, who don't know the truth about Jesus. And if we have this hope, and we know it, and it's encouraging, how much more would it be encouraging to those who live without hope? What light could we shine on, on the town of Gates and the city of Rochester by bringing this hope, this reality of the love of God, the good shepherd, to our community? And I can't think of a better way to do that than this Christmas Eve service. You know, that Christmas Eve service, that's the one holiday, one of two, Christmas Eve and Easter, where if you invite an unchurched person, most of the time they will say yes. They're looking for plans. They're looking for an opportunity. And I'm preparing my sermon in advance that day. And I'm just letting you know, I'm preaching John 3.16. I am preaching the gospel. I want people to hear the gospel, to respond to the gospel. And I want to see God do a mighty work in them and through them. But we need to invite them here. We need to, to take that step out in faith and, and offer them a lifeline when they need it so desperately. We've got a number of these eventually cards for our sermon series with details on how you can register and sign up. And I just encourage you, as you go out today, grab one or ten of these and invite that coworker, that neighbor, that family member who you've been praying for. And watch as God does immeasurably more than you can ask or imagine. Our world needs to know that God is a good shepherd. He never abandons his flock. And he'll never waste a valley. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up. And we're going to prepare for a time of communion together.